Hello, good evening everybody and uh, welcome to the Adventure Uncovered In Conversations series. We're delighted to have you joining us today. Uh, this is a first for us, um, so we're really excited and thank you very much for joining. Uh, my name is Ellie Mackay. I'm the host of this adventure series, this Adventure Uncovered Conversation. So, as you have probably found um, over the last few weeks, it's been pretty tricky for all of us adventurers who are used to getting out and about and exploring the world, um, being sort of you know stuck at home and perhaps not being able to get out as much as we wanted to. So what we're really excited to do is to bring you our series of online conversations. And we're doing that by talking to some of the most inspiring people in our community. Um, these are the filmmakers and the participants from our Adventure Uncovered Film Festival. So we're speaking to directors and the stars of films that have all been nominated or won in our previous series, as well as some conversations around the Adventure Uncovered community. And we're really excited to be able to bring those conversations to you online so that you can still be part of the Adventure Uncovered uh, group uh, in your living room. So do uh, join us in this community. This uh, We want it to be as interactive as possible. So there is a live chat uh, window and option um, on YouTube. Do please use that to get your comments in and questions uh, and thoughts and feelings and share everything that you can um, think of. We want this to be as participatory as possible. You can also share on social media using the hashtag AU Conversations, hashtag AU Conversations. Um, do follow us on Twitter and Instagram and on Facebook where you can find out more information about these talks and uh, myself and our guests every week are going to be online um, long into the night after the broadcast to continue any conversations that might come up. So today we're really excited to have Dan Raven Ellenson, who is the director of an amazing film called The UK in 100 Seconds. And we're going to be talking to him uh, live at the very end of this broadcast. Now, I uh, had the pleasure of chatting to Dan a couple of weeks ago and that conversation was filmed recorded uh, you may have already read a short blog that was written by one of our adventure uncovered superstars rosie uh, about that interview uh, so you may have read a little snippet of it and what we're going to play for you today is the film which is absolutely superb uk in 100 seconds and then we're going to play the interview where i spoke to dan uh, a couple of weeks ago with a really detailed exploration of that film after that, we're going to come back live to Dan, who's also here joining us uh, tonight to take your live questions. So if there's any burning questions that you have for Dan, then get them in that live chat uh, throughout the next 20 minutes or so. And he'll be joining us after the broadcast of that interview. So uh, we're going to watch the film first. This is a film that we featured in this year's Adventure Uncovered series. It's absolutely stunning. It's a work of art um, and with good reason it wowed our audiences and was one of our firm favourites for, uh, for the film festival. So um, I talked to Dan a little bit about filmmaking. I'm a filmmaker myself so we nerded out a little bit about drone technologies and all sorts um, and we talked a little bit about the meaning behind the film as well. If you haven't already seen the film this is a great opportunity for you to, to uh, experience it for the first time. It's a very short film, as hinted by the name. Um, if you have already seen it, I mean, I've seen this a, a many times and I'm sure you will get something new from it again. So we're gonna, without further ado, show you the film and the interview with Dan and we'll see you back here in about 20, 25 minutes to have some live Q&A with Dan. Um, with everything going on at the moment, we've had to postpone a couple of our live Adventure and Covered film festivals. We've decided to run a series of Adventure and Covered live broadcasts where we invite a couple of the filmmakers that have entered into the festivals to stream their film and then have a chat to us about it. But today, um, we're really delighted that we've got Ellie McKay in conversation with Dan Raven Ellison, um, who's the director of the UK in 100 Seconds. So we're going to show the UK in 100 Seconds, and then Ellie's going to chat to Dan about it.
What does the United Kingdom really look like? To get a better sense of proportion, let's go on a hundred second walk across our nation. Each second of the walk reveals 1% of our lands and how they look from above. Are you ready for the UK in 100 seconds? We walk through 22 kinds of lands that are gone in a blink. Houses and gardens occupy 5% of the UK and 5 seconds of our walk. We spend 6 seconds crossing natural grasslands and wander for 7 over sheep, graze, moors and heathlands. Peat bogs, which are carbon stores, are something else. Together, they cover 9% of the nation. And for 10 seconds, we're in the woods. And there's no place I'd rather be. For 27 seconds, we walk through fields of crops. Half is fed to livestock. In June, we mostly grow wheat, barley, oil seeds, peas and beans, corn, oats and vegetables. Our last 28% and 28 seconds takes us through pastures. This, the single biggest use of land, is mostly used for feeding and rearing cows and sheep. In all, at a time when more than one in ten British species are at risk of extinction, do we need to rethink this mix of lands we have and how we use them? I need more trees, please. I think more nature would be greater. So what if we made more space for nature? So we're joined now by two filmmakers, Ellie McKay and Dan Raven Ellison. Um, yeah, Dan, I'm so excited to have this time um, outside of the festival because we chatted a little bit very briefly, but I'd, I'd love to just talk in a little bit more depth about this film and some of the other work that you do. Yeah, um, so course. we've just seen this UK in 100 seconds again. I've watched this, I don't even know how many times, and every time it just, I get something different out of it. It's really powerful, really amazing. So there's a couple of things that I want to chat to you about. Um, but the first one is quite literally the fact this is such a novel concept. It's something that I've not seen in filmmaking um, it, to this kind of degree before. And I'm interested in exploration almost as a physical manifestation of geography, right? So mm -hmm. when you're out exploring, you're doing geography um, and um, a few years ago, back in, I think it was 2008, for the first time in the history of the planet, more people started living in urban than rural places. And I was a geography teacher at the time, and I was really fascinated by the fact that, that the young people I was working with had a very distorted sense of what cities look like. So I decided to do a project to try and challenge that distortion um, and to do a project where I started walking across entire cities. So Mexico City, for example, London, Mumbai, um, taking a photograph every eight seconds while walking across the urban area. But what I'd do is I'd measure the, the, the size of the urban area to just decide how long the walk should be. But then I wanted to go further to take a, 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 a better kind of sample to make sure that my route would go through the city in a way that represented the distribution of deprivation within those urban areas. So if the poorest uh, fifth of people in the city occupy just 2% of space, that only 2% of my walk would go through those kinds of areas. So walk across Mumbai, for example, people often think of all the informal housing um, throughout Mumbai, but actually it, th that's actually a relatively small footprint of the city as a whole. So only a small amount of my walk could go through those kinds of places. Or um, in London, for example, you know, in the media, people often think of um, the um, um, estates, and they think of Big Ben, and they think of the city of London, but the vast majority of London is Victorian terraced housing, you know, so mm -hmm. the walk would um, better reflect that typology of housing and land, but also the types of communities that we have throughout mm -hmm. our cities as well. So I was really interested in using photography 
back then to think about how we could um, represent, how we could represent cities in a way that removes some of the bias that we quite often see, that often mm. twists our imaginations and understanding of places. And as a result of that twisting and distorting, tends to sort of shift our opinion, I think, quite often in unhealthy ways. Um, mm. So the UK in 100 seconds really comes 10 years after um, I did that very first project, um, but thinking about um, land on a, on a bigger scale and with um, far better photographic techniques. And so, so that's amazing because you're, you're talking about really scientific detail of making sure the proportions of the, the deprivation, for example, match the, the temporal um, lag of time that that, that image appears. So you're, you're talking about a really scientific application of that methodology, but then doing it in a really creative way, which is something that I love, that, that blending. Why not just take that data, those proportions, those really sort of surprising proportions, and put them in a pie chart, for example, well, I'd go further. I mean, I'd, I'd say it's about story, actually. I mm. think that, that our identities are made up of our stories and our stories define who we are and our ambitions and our hopes and our dreams and, and how we communicate with others and how we create our histories and how we relate to one another. And in the UK 100 Seconds and the sister film that's out now as well, the Netherlands in 100 Seconds, mm. I'm walking centre frame. And so to some degree, even though you don't necessarily know who I are, you can relate to me as a person who's walking through that landscape. And there's no reason why you couldn't be that person too, because there's nothing mm. within those adventures that's really completely exceptional. Anyone could go and, go and do that. And also me, the person in the footage, also gives you a sense of scale and proportion um, and Absolutely. sense of place for where we're moving through as well. If it was just you know, you could do the same project using high resolution NASA images to some extent. Mm, and mm. as soon as you take the person out of it, as soon as you go that bit further out with that lens, mm -hmm. it becomes a bit sterile. And mm -hmm. if you then go into like a, a textbook and think about using a pie chart or a table, it becomes even more sterile. So, you know, what is a bog, a peat bog? I mean, the peat bogs in the film, I think, one of those beautiful moments. Oh, it's stunning. Yeah, really beautiful. Absolutely incredible. And you don't see that unless you are... Um, at that height, at that scale, looking at it from that angle, and then you see these incredible landforms and shapes that are coming out um, towards mm. you. Yeah, absolutely, totally agree. I couldn't agree more. I, I did. I was going to ask you. I, I was really interested when I was watching it how conscious the decision was to place the person at that scale and centre frame because it's very immersive, even though it's wide scale. And this is something I'm. I do a lot of drone cinematography, so um, you're often battling with. Drone imagery is amazing and it's powerful and it gives you this totally different perspective which can create all kinds of new um, ways of looking at the world, literally and figuratively, but then it's almost quite detached because we don't, we're not birds, we're not used to seeing that kind of element of the world. So how to maintain the personal element whilst getting the scale of the overview, I think was really cleverly done. Um, do you see it as a first person narrative or, or a third person narrative? It's definitely a third person narrative, I think, because not only because of the, the angle of the camera, but you know, I, mm. on that film, I intentionally um, wanted to have a voice that wasn't necessarily my voice, a voice that would yeah. give a different perspective on the landscape. And so collaborating with Benjamin Zephaniah, the poet, mm. you know, talking about a, a, a black guy from Birmingham who lives in Lincolnshire. And so, even just hearing his voice and his narrative adds an additional layer to the story. I think putting okay, me in yeah. third person, but also adding to the complexity of what the British landscape means, right? And, and, mm. and, and, how, that's, and how that's represented. Mm. But, but one of the things we did was, you know, we, we got these sort of shots filming from about um, um, 80, 90 meters up. And then what that meant was we were able to sort of clip the shot down so that I was pretty much so center um, as, as much as possible but then what we would then do within the the moments of footage that we've got we would we'd often look for stories that would then also make it more relatable so mm. you know um, not overplay this because actually we we didn't try to find exceptional moments or exceptional places we were looking to give people a real sense of normality of Britain rather mm -hmm. than something that's like some tourist advert mm -hmm. um, but, but things like being followed by a moment for a dog or having to jump over um, a ditch or you see these very small moments which mm. again become these relatable experiences that other people feel too so it's not just you know like a person walking through the middle of a shot in some sort of zombie-like way oh, when yeah. 
when that young bull, it looks like a big bull, when the young bull yeah. comes um, and chases me down, you know, that's, that's a little moment, that's a little story in its own right that, yeah. that goes yeah. beyond just the data, right? I think it, it's brilliant. You've done such a good job at getting that balance between the kind of impact and those incredible overview effect shots with the personal storytelling. And it's, it's very difficult to bring a character on a journey when, you know, you can't actually see their face, for example, but you still put that personality in there that, as you say, is, is very relatable. So it's, um, I think that's why it has such incredible appeal, the novelty combined with this kind of personal relatability. I think that in the story, I don't matter. Like, it's not about yeah, me, yeah. it's about you. And, and so not seeing the face, I think, in some ways is, is quite important because mm. it's not about me, it's not about personality, it's about the issue. And the more you can imagine that you could be that person i think the better Absolutely. yeah and that allows it allows me to go on that journey because i feel like i'm walking at the same pace as you i feel like i'm there with you but those as you say those little kind of non-touristy moments those little human elements add a very personal aspect a very relatable aspect to it in terms of then the specifics of filming um how did you find the the peat bogs what what kind of did you just scour uh google earth or did you are these places that you'd already known? The job of actually choosing locations, we used, um, I'm, I'm thankful of the European Union. The European Union have got a fantastic satellite uh, program. Um, and under Copernicus, they have a range of um, data that basically breaks down the whole of Europe into different classifications of land. So what we did was look at mapping for the whole of Britain, break up Britain along, along about 40 different classes of different types of land from industrial land to, um, to housing to uh, crops to um, pastures and so on. Worked out the amount of the land that's taken up by those different classes, use that to decide the 100 seconds, but then use the mapping to decide where in the country we should go. And yeah. some things are actually really hard to find, you know, so peat bogs are not very hard to find, especially when you're up in Scotland. But getting permission to go and film um, in a dump is, you know, not necessarily straightforward. Um, complex agriculture is like nearly half of the Netherlands film but it's in less than you know it's like two frames of the UK film and there's only a couple of places in like Scotland you know more places in Northern Ireland it's hardly anywhere really so it's very very hard to find. Brilliant so it's a real proper expedition as well with kind of the logistics and the planning and the discovery as you went along from going and looking at maps and finding out where to go which I like because that kind of harks back to traditional kind of expedition planning which ties in with the themes here at Adventure Uncovered as well. So then you were driven to do this because of the work that you've done as you said with the cities um, when, when you used to be a geography teacher um, and you kind of already knew that there was a misunderstanding about land use that you wanted to explore and that the, there was that story there that you wanted to tell. But were you then surprised when you did then sit down and look at these maps, these satellite images? Yeah, I mean, so when we set out for the project, the whole thing about the project was that I, I came to the revelation really that although I've got a geography degree, I was a geography teacher for years, all my work is in geography, that I had no idea what Britain looks like, because basically mm. it's just too big to get your head around. Um, mm. And I began to realise that maybe if I didn't know what Britain looked like, that maybe other people didn't know what Britain looked like too. And you know, a lot of the rhetoric over the last few years in the US and the UK has basically been in, in, in the tabloid media, um, along the idea that, you know, that Britain's full, there's no space for refugees, there's no space for migrants, there's no space for nature, there's no space for, for, space for affordable housing, mm -hmm. all these kinds of ideas, which are geographic ideas that are ultimately, you know, not actually correct, I think. Mm -hmm. So I decided to make this film partially because I wanted to know myself what the UK looks like in proportion, mm -hmm. because those, those tables and those charts and those graphs are just too sterile. So yeah, I mean, certainly surprised by how little of Britain is taken up by, by houses and gardens. Mm -hmm. um, but but really flabbergasted and shocked and maybe ashamed slightly at the, the, the sheer amount of space we give over to cows and sheep. You know, we're mm -hmm. going through an ecological crisis where one in 10, maybe one in seven British species are at risk of extinction. You know, wildlife worldwide has been completely um, decimated. Um, that we, we, we're going, you know, we're in the middle of a climate emergency where nature-based solutions are definitely part of the answer. But then we've also got these different issues around a housing crisis and a refugee crisis and th these other things outplaying. And mm. actually, maybe if we had a little bit less milk and cheese, 
and we had a few more trees and hedgerows and places for people to play out, then we'd actually go a long way towards solving some of those problems. And I think that was what the film helped me understand even more deeply and also helps mm. to show, but hopefully without coming across as being too worthy or judgy. Well, that's, that's the power of presenting data in an engaging way is that you then don't need to put a, a spin or an editorial on it. You can just present it and say, look at this. What kind of, on a personal level, impact do you want this to have um, for individuals who watch it? Yeah, I think that when you start thinking about social, environmental, um justice you know there's different reasons why we should care more for other life on the planet mm -hmm. um i think just just you know and, and i think that what the, the film showed me maybe that i hadn't thought about before is maybe this idea of a, a spatial geographical need for justice so the fact that that so few people in britain own so much of the land and that mm -hmm. so much of the land is given up um, for for hunting or for sheep or for you know farming practices which are a counter to what the world needs right at the moment mm -hmm. I think presents a, a spatial injustice that is unfair so there might be a number of reasons why you might want to um, not eat so many other like sentient beings right mm -hmm. you might just like to care for other animals and not want to hurt them very much is a reason you might want to do it for your own health you might want to do it because you realize it has a smaller ecological footprint on the planet which is good for a range of things but another angle is at a time when so few people own so much and so yeah. few people have so much control over so much that perhaps it's not quite right from a, a proportionate sharing sense you know i'm not sure that makes sense um mm -hmm. it's not yeah, fair no, it makes perfect it? sense. yeah, yeah. there's the social fair. justice element yeah absolutely it's uh, there's a lot of people you know doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do but it's nice to almost have that geographical data and looking at it from as you say a social justice point of view of inequality that that adds another another layer of justification well, people, to you know. people could people could watch the film and take from it that that um there's lots of space for more housing mm. um yeah well, rather than saying that it's an argument for for more nature or whatever else and actually i think that, that actually you know it, it probably shows that we can manage both we probably actually sure. could manage a lot more housing in the country which might be quite useful for people who can't afford yeah. housing at totally, the moment yeah. But yeah, we can also afford sense. an awful lot more nature as well. You know, you can, yeah. there's space for both if we have less milk and cheese. I mean. Exactly. Really nice, really clear and, and a very hopeful kind of positive uh, message to take away there. Let's talk about the festival because you entered this film in the Adventure Uncovered Film Festival. Um, let me ask you kind of what, what drove you to do that and uh, what kind of success have you seen? What's the process been like? Compared to a lot of film festivals, um, I think there's a real strong sense of, of community and drive and that it really stands for something around, you know, wanting um, a better world in which we have more of that environmental and social justice um, and communicating that through the power of storytelling and, and film and bringing people together who, who share those values, I think is, is, is really brilliant. And but I, I think I'd pivot and not really talk about my own work off film. I mean, I think that it's great to be at a film festival where you're seeing um, different people share their work and at the at the the last event the, the thing that really stuck with me there was one lady who, who did a film about her doing um, um wild swimming in sort of some mm. cold area in the north of, of britain and when you watch like 30 films or 20 films in a night quite often it's interesting which ones stay with you and which ones go totally yeah yeah and her film was really quite in many ways in terms of film and story there was a lot of simplicity to it but there was such a beauty to the film as well. And what I really took away from it was that, that by, by, being, by being selected to be in this film festival, something that she never thought would happen, she then had the confidence to show her film to her colleagues at work because she saw that the film was worthy and then worthy of doing it. And, you know, in this, in this film, she's exposing her, uh, her feelings about her, her, her body, her mental health, her physical health, as she goes wild swimming in these sort of ridiculously cold mm -hmm. places. I'd never want to swim in that. Um, and the fact that the, that the imprint and the reach of the festival then goes beyond the people who are in the, the, in the room itself, but actually the way in which it then sort of um, goes out into communities like that, I think is extraordinarily powerful, um, both in terms of the confidence that it gave her, but also how the festival then had reached to those, 
uh, people who wouldn't have necessarily come to, to, to the event. Um, so yeah, I think it's really strong stuff. I was really pleased to be asked and to be involved. Fantastic, yeah, thank you so much. It's great to hear that because those are the kind of the two elements that we really strive for. One is really building the community and, and as you say, allowing those films to, to be shared and to spread far beyond the, the walls of, of the theatre or the cinema. But I, I love that you started this by saying that um, adventure is geography, you know, going out there in the world and walking out in the fields, that is geography. Um, it, it's great to kind of, I, I feel the same. I feel I would say that adventure is science, you know, going out into the world, observing and noticing, looking, testing, um, you know, going back to certain places and seeing change. What's next for you? Well, at the moment I'm juggling a few different things, but I've, I'm currently working on a project called the Slow Ways Project, um, which is oh, essentially... Nice a reimagining of all the 200,000 kilometres of public rights away in the UK and thinking about what if they made up one single network of footpaths intentionally designed for people who want to walk either between neighbouring settlements, right, because they just want to get from, I don't know, York to Sheffield or to daisy chain multiple routes to get from one side of the country to the other. But, you know, currently our, our footpaths are very much focused on, um, I guess, leisure in the countryside yeah it's sure about in, in, in a situation where we're in the, the, the so desperately need more people to be walking for the environment for people's health mm -hmm. it's far more just about getting back to the roots of why those footpaths existed in the first place and saying well what actually if we had more people just walking between towns and cities because mm. that's a good way to go and uh, meet people go and do some work whatever um Fantastic. so it's a reimagining of that Okay, well, so hopefully you found that conversation as interesting and fascinating as I did. I think uh, we could have been talking um, all night probably and had a lot more to talk about. So it's with great pleasure that I can now introduce Dan. Hi, Dan. Hey, how are you doing? Good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, very good, thank you. Lovely evening. So you've, your hair has grown quite a lot in two weeks, actually. <laughs> yeah, I, I just cut it really short, hadn't I, uh, before that interview? That's right. Okay, so um, thank you so much for having that conversation with me a couple of weeks ago. And we did cover quite a lot in that. But um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of people who want to know even more. So thank you for joining us again for this live Q&A now. Um, and if you haven't yet submitted your questions, then do um, add them into the live chat. Uh, or you can also uh, tweet us on Twitter using the hashtag Adventure Uncovered conversation so hashtag au conversations um, and we'll try and ask those all to dan now dan and i will also stay on twitter for the rest of this evening to answer any questions in a bit more detail or to have a conversation if needed so we've already had a couple through dan so i'm going to get straight into it john has asked a question um, and he said there's been a lot of positive news and policy change announced recently in the uk towards advancing the health of our cities in light of covid19 um, and he's given the example of sadiq khan's recent announcements um, in london so uh, he wants to know how do you see this playing out is this something we should be excited about it's kind of what you've been asking for um, you know do you think it's all and excuse the pun from john hot air well, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Because depending on how you look at it, things can go different directions, can't they? Because on one hand, it's great that there's this lockdown and that uh, the lockdown is being used by the mayor to leverage more opportunities to pilot um, guerrilla interventions and um, 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 all kinds of activities across the city to encourage more cycling and walking. But on the other hand, there's going to be a whole load of people who won't want to cycle and walk or won't, more importantly, want to use public transport because they're afraid um, that they're going to they're catch something off other people. So and there, there are all these examples where there are these sort of double-edged swords about what may, may happen next. What I'm most excited about looking at on my 
Victoria Terrace Street in, in London, is actually the way in which community resilience has really been built up by this experience. So regardless of what government does, how things are changing on the ground. So on my street, there's a WhatsApp group where there wasn't a WhatsApp group before. That WhatsApp group has been used for people to um, share stuff, a band is set up, a socially distanced band is set up um, on the street. Lots of really good things are happening. And what I'm interested in is when um, COVID sort of slips away, how some of those WhatsApp groups maybe evolve into activating and inspiring people to actually make cities far more green, healthy and wild, something that I'm uh, working on through the London uh, National Park City movement. So I think that, that, that who knows what governments will do, right? Who knows whether or not they can maintain pedestrianised better city centres. But what I do know is that the appetite for people to collaborate with their neighbours is ferocious at the moment. And if that can be leveraged to go beyond making you know, colourful rainbows in windows and actually to making our cities far more livable in the long term, then I think that's a really exciting, exciting opportunity. In terms of this film and about whether or not people are going to um, in a big way, have a better relationship with nature and reform our access to the, to the countryside and how we, um, you know, use our land in the UK. I think that's a that's a slightly another question. I think. Absolutely, fair enough. I think you make a really good point there about um, people are, are sort of desperate for communication and connection with their neighbours. And something that we love at Adventure Uncovered is the the fostering and nurturing of community um, and whatever scale that means to you, whether that is you and your neighbour, um, you know, sharing a lawnmower instead of each of you buying one. Um, and these kind of small uh, grassroots movements to get people out and about and connect with nature more. So I think that's really exciting to hear that is already happening in these small pockets. And, you know, do we then sort of need to grow that or what's required to expand that or maintain that beyond the COVID situation? It's interesting, isn't it? Some of the key things that have come up because in one sense, one of the big conversations nationally has been about um, clearly our healthcare system, which is fundamentally critical illness infrastructure, right? It's there to deal with us when we get sick. And then the other part of the conversation, a lot of it has been about access to nature, access to the great outdoors, access to parks, which fundamentally is our infrastructure for our well-being to actually stop us from even needing that critical um, illness infrastructure. So for me, what, what COVID has kind of brought up in quite a big way is actually there's people who have always been unwell or always not had proper access to green space. And it's kind of highlighted and made those things far clearer. And actually we need to use the clarity maybe this situation has provided of those injustices to make sure that we deal with those uh, into the future going forward. But, you know, to, to the point of the question about how city centres are being locked down for travel, I think I'm really interested, not just in, well, how do we make cities more walkable and better for cyclists, but it's thinking like you're saying about community in terms of hyper, 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 hyper local journeys. So can I go out and play on my street, which is a five minute, five metre journey maybe. It's still a journey. It's still about sharing um, ideas and love and compassion and developing relationships. It's just that the journey's shorter and actually we need more people to be making shorter journeys uh, to make our cities and our country healthier. Fantastic. That's a really good point. Um, it sort of links a little bit to the next question, which is from Sarah in Islington. Um, thank you, Sarah. And, and she said that she's heard a lot about rewilding initiatives in Scotland and other parts of the UK outside of England. Um, but do you know of any significant regions in England that there are nature based solutions that are, are playing out? So, you know, what, what, do you, what do you interpret by nature-based solutions and then, you know, maybe some England-based uh, solutions that you might know about? Yeah, well, clearly, you know, we desperately need to have a better relationship with nature and having a better relationship with nature can not only improve our own mental health, physical health and well-being, not only that of actually um, um, society as a whole and our ability to, to thrive and flourish on the planet, which is going through this ecological and climate emergency that, that, that we face. But it's also true of the land as well. And actually, whether it's thinking about flooding, whether it's thinking about temperatures, whether it's thinking about um, um, species surviving, um, we need to think of ways in which we can allow nature to flourish and to be well in order to support all those other systems that we need to be well in the world, including the human system, right? But also, like I say, tackling those different emergencies. So there's a, a wide range of examples 
of where this has happened, right? From um, um, environment agency deciding that rather than putting up big uh, brick walls at the sea, they're going to have managed retreat and they're going to have uh, the water sort of flooding in and using the land that way instead. Brilliant projects at NET, for example, where there's sort of semi-rewilding projects going on. So you can sort of Google and search that. For me, the one that excites me the most actually is one that I've been involved with, which is around thinking about cities, you know? So when you look at um, um, national parks around the world, there are national parks that are every single major type of habitat you can imagine from deserts to moorlands to rainforests, every single major one, apart from urban areas. So the campaign I got involved with and helped lead starting seven years ago was to make London the world's first national park city, a new kind of national park. And fundamentally, that's about rewilding our imaginations, our hopes, our dreams, our ambitions, our desires for the city. And that is not necessarily always about things happening at a grand scale. That can just be about allowing weeds, which aren't really weeds. Weeds are just plants somewhere where people don't want to be. Allowing plants to thrive in cracks in your pavement or to allow um, many of your gardens go a little bit more feral, so it's great for foxes and butterflies and this kind of thing. So in reality, we see a lot of this happening in the city as it is anyway. But I think that it, the more we can make that happen where most people in the world live, in urban environments, the more we'll engender in their, um, in their hopes and ambitions that they actually live in a, a world where more people are compassionate to nature and look after it and allow it to thrive. Fantastic message there and um, hopefully one we can all subscribe to uh, over the coming weeks and months and long into the future. Uh, we've had a question from um, somebody at Climate Action online um, on the YouTube chat. Very quick fire round here. What's the wildest part of the UK you found, you found yourself in during the filming? I suppose it depends on your definition of wildest, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does depend on your definition of wildest. Um, probably the very, very far north coast uh, of Scotland, I think, probably, up towards sort of done it head that way. Um, in reality, there are some places that we're in the north of Scotland which are technically far more remote and wild than that. But in terms of my human experience in the environment, probably that part of the country. OK, thank you. And um, sticking with the filming, uh, not so much the actual filming itself, but the response to the film, uh, we've got a question, great question from Jeff, who's watching. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for joining us. Um, he wants to know what was the most surprising response to the 100 Seconds film? I think the most surprising response is, uh, this is going to sound like a really false answer. In some ways, the surprising um, response is um, it's almost that it's not a surprise, right? It's almost like uh, the premise of the film is that no one knows what the Brit Britain really looks like and doesn't, don't, we don't really have a very good sense of proportion. And that there's so much space to make the country clearly far greener, far wilder, and far more enjoyable for adventure for all of us. And the surprise really in some ways is that despite the fact we have that knowledge and awareness, there's so little willingness to create the change that we need in the ownership and access and nature of the landscape. So it feels like with COVID, to go back to that point, you know, it's almost like the government needed to get to such a crisis point before acting that, that actually, quite clearly, they acted too late. And you look in terms of the climate emergency, and you're like, my gosh, how long do we have to be talking about this before like, we reach a crisis point where it will also be too late? You know, and you look back through these different crises and histories and similar things play out. But then the same in some ways is true, I think, in terms of people, that there have been clearly an opportunity in front of people and those opportunities not being sort of taken by the horns and actually dealt with properly. And there is an opportunity right now to do something gloriously incredible with landscape in Britain through rewilding, starting on a small scale and getting larger. I mean, not, some people don't like the word rewilding, but I think in terms of just thinking about having a better relationship with nature and maximizing the potential for wildlife and people to thrive in the landscape. And quite clearly, if a minority of people own the majority of the land, and if the majority of the land is used for milk and cheese and is being used inefficiently, then clearly there's a lot of opportunity to do some quite creative things. And for me, a policy, right, which would be like a fraction of a fraction of a percent would be to double the size of all the hedgerows in the UK and to have hollowways and paths going down through all of them and to use those also as part of the nature recovery network for wildlife to move around as well. And that'd be a fraction of a percent. So why don't we just do that, right? Like, let's just do that. Not every hedgerow, but most of them. 
so then okay we've got these sort of potential big dreams or plans you know if you could make wave a magic wand and, and double those hedgerows i'm sure that you would um how about let's think about for everybody who's watching are there th sort of three steps that you would recommend that are achievable that are feasible that are the right scale that you know maybe something that somebody could do tomorrow like small medium large something that everybody could do tomorrow whether that be a physical you know something to do with their garden or is it signing a petition um is there something they can do then in the next week or the next month and then there's there something they can do in the next year could we have kind of a, a toolkit um kind of example list of how we watching everybody watching could all get involved and do their bit walk more grow more stop hurting animals okay. <laughs> i think that a lot of it comes down to those things so if we if we walked more then that would make mean that we are more physically well more mentally well it would reduce air pollution and we would spend more time with each other right in those environments grow more because growing more increases the amount of uh, habitat and food in the environment if we do that locally for ourselves and, and for wildlife and stop har har harming animals in the sense that i think that if we if we just had the, the general idea that we shouldn't have unconsensual harmful relationships with other sentient beings right um then the world would be a better place because the way in which we're harming animals at the moment isn't just by for example choosing to eat certain species but it's also the neglect and harm of their environment their habitats which by the way is also our environment and habitat as well and at the moment it's almost like we're, we're trying to sabotage our own existence as well as theirs so i think those those three things would be my simple things and they're, they're small things but ultimately if everyone did those things more it would have um, a landscape scale impact and, and as we've seen with several uh, sort of famous quotes that we don't need a few people doing this perfectly, 100%, we need a million people doing it imperfectly. So if everybody just makes a little change, um, it is hard to make these permanent uh, sort of life changes, these behavioral changes, but you can start step by step. And if everybody does it, then we're onto a, onto a winner. Right, and there's something just in terms of the way that democracy works, I think a little bit as well in terms of politicians quite often taking the lead from what what actually what the public need and what the public are doing and you, you see within certain wards certain neighborhoods certain boroughs certain cities where communities are doing those things together well and so that then gives not only the confidence for politicians to support more policies around for example more walking more cycling and um, whatever it might be um, but also you're more likely to get the right kind of leaders coming through into those political decisions who are more likely to make good decisions as well, which means you then got those people to, to vote for as well. I mean, at the moment, for example, you know, I don't know what Sadiq Khan's thinking in terms of London as a whole, but quite clearly, if we're really worried about, for example, say 40,000 people dying of COVID, then 10,000 people dying of air pollution every year is clearly like as if not more unacceptable and so if we're saying that it's unacceptable to expose people to covid then surely it's also unacceptable to expose people to toxic air right which is uh, killing them basically or, or or stunting their growth or harming you know the way in which their brain develops so given that how do we create the political capital and support so that we have more walking more cycling better public transport and less cars on the roads and actually, it's precisely through those three things I just described, which helps to bolster the right kind of political leadership that's needed for the right policies and right budgets to make those things happen, in my view. Perfect. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic view. Um, so we've actually already run out of time. Um, this has just been so interesting. We've gone, we're going to finish with one final question um, and a good chance for you to kind of plug this, uh, this project. James is asking about uh, how the Slow Ways project is going. So if you can just clarify what that is um, and then kind of tell us the latest um, and maybe uh, what's coming up next. Yeah, great. So, um... So one of the things you would have seen through the film is that I've done a lot of walking. I've done a lot of walking in the UK. Um, and um, it was during that that I began thinking of this idea of the Slow Ways Project, which essentially is to connect up all the towns, cities, and large villages in the UK with a network of 7,000 curated walking routes. So you can either walk between two neighboring settlements 
and the average route actually we've worked out is about 10 to 12 kilometers. Um, or you can daisy chain multiple routes. So if you want to walk from Swansea to Huddersfield, rather than Google telling you how to get there, actually you've got a whole load of uh, people who are walkers who can tell you how to daisy chain through towns and cities to, to make that journey or where, wherever you want to go. So the project began just before lockdown, a team of core seven volunteers helped come up with an overview map of all these routes across the UK. And then we ran some webinars and 700 volunteers got involved. And, and sort of eight weeks later, we've got these 7,000 routes across the UK. Um, we're currently putting down a website um, and a map of how they all connect together. And then hopefully late summer, early autumn, we'll be looking to recruit maybe 10,000 people to go and test them all. That's the plan. Fantastic. Well, hopefully everybody in the Adventure Uncover community can be your your first volunteers for that. I'm sure there'll be lots of us that will be desperate to get out there and test all those walks out. I think it's a fabulous idea and all the best with it. So on that note, unfortunately, we've run out of time again. Um, but thank you so much, Dan, for joining us. Uh, you are going to be available on Twitter for the your next few hours tonight. Um, if anybody has any burning questions, didn't get a chance to ask in the live chat. Um, is that OK? What's your what's your handle? at Dan Raven Ellison. Okay, perfect. And as long as people use the, the hashtag AU conversations, then we'll all be able to um, follow along with those conversations. Um, these, these broadcasts, these conversations are designed to be uh, a stimulus, the beginning of the conversation. So we've had, you know, this sort of 45 minutes today, tonight to chat to Dan, but we do want it to spark conversations and spin off conversations amongst our community. So do please engage, uh, engage with us through social media uh, or otherwise. Um, and one of the things that you can do to engage with us is to sign up to our newsletter. So if you head to the website, adventureuncovered.com, you can sign up to our news, uh, newsletter. You'll find out all about the next of these conversations we're going to be every Thursday evening for our conversation series um, and you can also read some amazing uh, blogs there's a lot on there about cycling at the moment there's a fantastic uh, blog uh, written piece about cycling and we've got some brilliant information about our outdoor events which we're thankfully um, looking at being able to bring back and restart again um, post COVID. So uh, do check out our 2021 calendar, which is going to be coming up soon. Sign up to our newsletter to be the first to find out all about those. And for more of these, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel. And if you subscribe to us, you'll get ping notifications next time we're live and you can join us again. So it's uh, just a goodbye from me. Thank you so much, Dan, for joining us and hope to see you again very soon. And meanwhile, we're going to see you next Thursday where we have an amazing conversation with three incredible women. We've got Danielle, Bronwyn and Christina all in conversation about their film. So I'll leave you with a reminder of that. Thank you so much for joining us and hope to see you again next week. Bye. Okay.